Well, good evening and welcome to the um, Kennedy Wright opening lecture for 2013 to 14. This annual lecture honours two distinguished New Testament teachers who together cover the emergence of Christianity and the early church, two areas of particular interest, of course, to the Centre for the Study of Christian Origins, known as Cisco to those of you who aren't well informed. Professor H.A.A. Kennedy studied both classics and theology at Edinburgh, and after taking up a post at John Knox College in Toronto, he returned to New College in 1909 as Chair of New Testament Language, Literature and Theology, a post that he held until his retirement in 1925. Of his many contributions to the discipline, he's best known for arguing that the New Testament was composed in ordinary Koine Greek, for his work on Paul's eschatology and links with mystery religions, and his study of Philo of Alexandria. His works show a commitment to historical analysis and a sensitivity to emergent Christianity's Greco-Roman context that still guides the work of Cisco and its members today. The same is true of our other honoree, Professor David Wright, who died only in 2008 and is still remembered fondly by many of us here tonight. After studying at both Cambridge and Oxford, Professor Wright came to New College in 1964 as lecturer in church history and remained here for four decades, taking an active role in many aspects of university life and being appointed to a personal chair in patristics and reformed Christianity in 1999. Professor Wright was particularly distinguished for his work on the Latin Church Fathers, especially Augustine, in the field of Reformation studies and for his work on the influence of the Church Fathers on the Protestant Reformation. So we count ourselves extremely privileged here at Edinburgh to stand in the tradition of such great scholars as Professors Kennedy and Wright. And we hope that this annual lecture is at least a small tribute to the academic debts that we owe to them. And our inaugural lecture last year, and perfect timing, was a splendid discussion of recent scholarship on Constantine, given by Professor Tim, Timothy Barnes. And we're expecting another outstanding paper here tonight by yet another distinguished scholar whose work, again, would have been of great interest to Professors Kennedy and Wright. Professor Judith Liu studied at the universities of both Durham and Birmingham and went on to teach at the Queen's College Birmingham, King's College London, Macquarie University Sydney, and is currently Lady Margaret's Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. She's published widely on the New Testament, particularly on John's Gospel and the Johannine and Catholic Epistles, on Jewish-Christian relations in the first centuries, on second-century Christianity, and on gender and identity in early Christianity. She's recently almost completed a study of Marcion, locating him within the literary, social, and theological contexts of the second century. And her paper tonight is going to share some of her research on Marcion with us. It's entitled Marcion and the Corruption of the Gospel, and I hope you'll um, join with me in welcoming Professor Liu to New College. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you very much uh, to those who gave this invitation. It's a great honour to be giving this Kennedy Wright lecture. Uh, I looked, but I wasn't able to find a suitable quotation from either uh, Kennedy or Wright on which to sort of hang the lecture, but I'm sure they both would have agreed that the corruption of the gospel was generally a bad thing. <laughs> whether they would have agreed, or whether I would have agreed with them as to what the corruption of the gospel is, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but then my subtitle uh, po points towards the direction in which we will be exploring that question ourselves this evening. Instead then from starting uh, from either Kennedy or Wright, uh, we're going to start from someone who Professor Barnes will recognise, I trust, from Tertullian. Uh, early in book four of his five books against Marcion, 
he writes, I say that my gospel is true, Marcion says his is, I assert that Marcion's is falsified, Marcion says mine is. Were it not for the fact that by then Marcion was already dead, those words always envisaged for me two children in the playground saying, my mummy's car is faster than yours. No, my mummy's car is faster than yours. There is no room for compromise. Only one side can be right. And echoing Tertullian, really, the conventional uh, question has been, well, which of them was right? The more important one, I think, and the one that we shall be considering this evening, is what is at stake here. However, before we start and try and answer that question, I suppose we should be saying something about Marcion. To some of you, Marcion may well be a familiar figure, to others perhaps less so. So it would no doubt be useful if I could start with an introduction and summary. But however, to do so immediately becomes difficult, if not impossible, and would undermine my own scholarly principles. For the Marcion whom we can describe is always the Marcion of his opponents. I may have to modify this statement as I proceed, but in principle we have no writings that survive by Marcion or by his followers. I may be over-pessimistic, or since I'm writing a book, perhaps over-optimistic, but I don't expect the, dis- the sudden discoveries such as delighted those scholars of Gnosticism from Nag Hammadi or scholars of, Ma- of Manichaeism from Turfan uh, or Medinat Mani to suddenly provide us with something else. Marcion is always refracted through polemic. For the main part, the polemics from the pens of those who were to be characterised as normative or orthodox Christianity. Polemics against Marcion and against his followers begin in the 2nd century in Greek. They continue until the 7th century and beyond, spreading to Latin, to Syriac, to Armenian, to Arabic. They continue in Islamic sources, But already, probably before then, they are to be found in earlier Jewish sources and in sources from other groups who would have understood themselves as, in some sense, Christian. Sometimes these polemical writings betray that there were still those who were perceived as, or called themselves, Marcionites. But more often we may suspect that they simply fulfil the role of, at one stage I would have said, the reds under the beds, Now, if your newspapers north of the border have been as engaged as those south of the border, I suppose I would have to say Marxists. In the former case, when they do reflect reflect perhaps real communities, we may sometimes catch glimpses of their beliefs and lives. But more often we shall think, I'm sure I have read that before. Because in most cases... We would have read that before. Polemics written by early Christians carry a particular difficulty, and they were not unique in this, but shared much with their contemporaries. And I suspect, actually, in the light of recent events, our contemporaries. Polemical writers of the time were not inclined to check their sources. They were not inclined to worry about libel accusations, or to make sure that they were being logical or consistent. They were not inclined to acknowledge ignorance if they had no accurate information. Rather, they enthusiastically repeated what people before them had said and had written, often without citing their sources, certainly without checking them. Generally, this is equally true whether they knew of any contemporary adherents of the hated position who might be studied and used to substantiate the charges. So who are these sources to which we shall be referring? Well, it might seem a bit vague, but then he is a bit blurred or pale to our eyes. 
but of the sources who we might encounter, who speak to him, we will encounter Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century, Irenaeus a little bit later, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, uh, the pseudo Hippolytus refutation, Epiphanius with his medicine chest against all heresies, uh, the dialogue of Adamantius perhaps a bit later, very important Ephraim Cyrus, for whom still, writing either in Nisibus or Edessa, one feels at times, feels himself in a minority. Uh, Marcion is one of his opponents, the others being Bardison and Marni, uh, but still he sometimes feels as if he is oppressed by these opponents. Esnick of Coba in the following uh, century, and Theodoret of Cyrus, who can still claim to have converted whole villages. We cannot look at Marcion without looking at him through the various lenses that are brought upon him by these various polemical writings. We cannot try and understand him without trying to understand how polemic works and how we are supposed to read it. Before we can enter a relationship with Marcion, first we have to enter a relationship with his opponents. So we will start with Justin Martyr, writing his apology sometime in the middle of the second century, with perhaps the most basic of information. Marcion, who came from Pontus. Marcion, certainly one must say, a real figure, Although sometimes when people ask me about the historical Marcion, I say I'm not sure that we can know as much as we may or may not know of the historical Jesus. Uh, but unlike heretics like Ebion, who becomes created out of a label, the Ebionites, Marcion, surely a historical figure. From Pontus, for his opponents, from the fringes of the empire, a place to be disparaged although undoubtedly Marcion was a Greek speaker, almost certainly a city dweller, later associated with Sinope there, although that already is a later claim. Marcion, who came from Pontus, who even now teaches, even now therefore perhaps still a contemporary of Justin in about 150. Again, later tradition will be more precise and date, Mar date Marcion's date, although quite which date in his career, to about 144. Some have argued for an earlier date, but I'm not going to explore that this evening. What Justin Martyr is doing here is he's introducing Marcion as an example of those who called themselves Christians the Christians whom, in his apology, Justin Martyr is seeking to defend, but who, according to Justin, has no right to that epithet. And it may well be that apologetic context which explains why Justin starts where he does, with Marcion's denunciation of the creator God and proclamation of another God. That element will then become a stable element in subsequent accounts of Marcion, although later Christian writers are much more interested in framing this as a rejection of the law and the prophets, and even of the God of the Jews. Note there that Justin says nothing about Marcion's writings, nothing about that gospel which we heard of from Tertullian. That may be no great surprise, although Justin himself appeals to Jesus' teaching, to narratives about Jesus, and does know the word gospel or gospels. Written accounts seem to have a somewhat ambiguous role for him, and it remains somewhat unclear precisely which writings of the later New Testament Justin himself knows. For him still, scripture is that which later Christians would call the Old Testament. This changes when we come to Irenaeus of Lyon, whose writing, his great work, 
against heresies. And there he adds to something like what we have seen, although already modified from Justin, the fact that Marcion adopted and adapted a gospel, namely the third gospel conventionally known as according to Luke, and also at the end of that quotation, the letters of Paul. We'll come back to this passage again later. And we are by now with the beginning, the building blocks, as it were, of what will become the Marcion who is constructed by later writers. The Marcion who is shaped by his opponents. Marcion of Pontus teaching another god who is soon known as Marcion's god, unknown, the stranger god, who rejects the creator, has a hatred of creation and of becoming, genesis, because the creator is judicial and consistent and somewhat bellicose, who blasphemes the God who gave the law, who after all, if you've read his CV in the scriptures, is somewhat bellicose and occasionally inconsistent, and who, according to later views, does away with the Old Testament, who proclaims another Christ, a Christ sent by the unknown God without undergoing birth, who has a gospel, then defined as perverting the gospel of Luke, who thinks that Paul alone was true, and so edits a collection of Paul's letters, the Apostolicon, thus forming a combination of gospel and letters, according to some, a New Testament. The italics, as it were, uh, reflecting the development of the tradition and the interpretation of the tradition. And already within those building blocks of what sort of Marcion his opponents are creating, and also, therefore, what sort of Marcion we can create. There comes a fundamental conflict between where does he start as a philosopher or does he start as a biblicist? Are you going to go down that, la that table, as it were, starting at the top, or are you going to start at the bottom and work upwards? The Marcion that we have is the Marcion that is shaped by his opponents. A Marcion who starts there again up in the Black Sea and I hope you notice that I've acknowledged where I got this from uh, I can't remember quite where but it was on the web uh, but it's the University of Edinburgh uh, showing, some of you may recognise it from your teaching I don't know, actually showing the spread of early Christianity towards 250 uh, but most of those coloured areas uh, with the possible exception of southern Spain could also be marked as areas to which uh, Marcionites are reflected in the sources at the same sort of time as the spread of Christianity. We are caught between the perspective that we get through the lens of his opponents and something happening there on the ground. Uh, and perhaps at the nub of that, there is the question that we're going to explore this evening of Marcion and Marcion's gospel. Marcion and the corruption of the gospel. Remember those words of Tertullian. I say that his is adulterated. He says that mine is. So that sets a sort of broad context or background for what we're now going to go on to look at. And what I'm particularly interested in this evening is, again, those words of Italian and that question of the corruption of the gospel, which Marcion seems almost to embody for early Christian writers. And because Justin and Irenaeus and Italian and Epiphanius and Ephraim are each allowed their own construction of Marcion, I'm going to give you my construction of Marcion, as reliable as each of theirs, or as unreliable as each of theirs, you take your pick. There, again, at where we are starting. In my Marcion, Marcion does, as Tertullian said, say something about a corrupted gospel, even though he would have said it long before. Italian said it. And why does he say 
He says it because he reads Galatians. Galatians is the first of the Pauline letters in Marcion's corpus of Paul. And there already he finds the problem of the gospel, which as soon as the gospel is mentioned, is as it were shadowed by its perversion, by its corruption, even possibly proclaimed by an angel. He finds that theme repeated as he works through Galatians. And those of you who are busy following your Nestle Island of Galatians 2, as I'm sure you all are, you've just got it in your mind, uh, you will be familiar of the reading uh, on account of the false brothers. But as Tertullian reports Marcion, although there's no textual evidence at that point, he thinks that what we've got is false apostles. Again, the gospel the truth of the gospel. He meets them again later on in Galatians 2 where we have the rest of the Jews joined in his, you all know that his is of course Peter, Peter's hypocrisy. Again, they are not working with the truth of the gospel. And there in 2 Corinthians and in Marcion's Apostolicon, you go from Galatians to 1 and 2 Corinthians before you come to Romans. There in 2 Corinthians, you meet those false apostles once again. Notice, by the way, I've tried through my colour to help you begin to pick up threads of what we would call intertextuality of some kind. Notice again, you've got the angel. False apostles workers of fraud, even Saint Satan. Of course, Paul does not belong to those groups who pervert the gospel. We are not like the rest. Remember the rest? There in Galatians 2.13. We are not like the rest in Codex Bizi and P45, not actually in the... Alexandrian text, who peddle the word of God. In the Latin translation, adultero. We do not behave with malice or fraudulently handle the word of God, unlike some who do, uh, particularly uh, leading astray, those whom the God of this age, a passage which even modern commentators uh, spend some time trying to make sense of, and which undoubtedly was a very significant passage uh, for Marcion. That passage from 2 Corinthians 4 with its reference to the God of this age. He finds again the same tradition we're back in Galatians, where there is perhaps someone who is upsetting them. Again, the theme of fraud, fraud fraudulently handling, perverting corrupting. And of course Paul knows someone who is not like that at all namely himself even if there was an angel from Satan sent to torment him. So there we have out of those quotations from Galatians and 2 Corinthians a narrative. A narrative of the corruption of the gospel in which is implicated an angel which may after all be Satan who converts himself into an angel of light, or at least the work of the God of this age, exercised by those who can be classified as false apostles, remembering that even false apostles can convert themselves into apostles of Christ. You don't have to be very much into conspiracy theories to be able to work out how all that fits together uh, into a single narrative. A narrative of the corruption of the gospel or the perversion of the gospel that overshadows its very beginnings, threatening even Paul himself. A narrative that, Paul, that Marcion reads out of Paul's letters, although in some cases out of Paul's letters and the textual version he received them in, or possibly he adapted them towards. According to Tertullian, 
Marcion's followers say that Marcion did not bring in a new rule by the separation of law and gospel so much as restore one that had been falsified, adulterato. There, the word that we have uh, in Latin twice in the, in the middle bits in, in the passages from 2 Corinthians. There, then, we have one narrative of the corruption of the gospel. We're going to turn now to another narrative of the corruption of the gospel, and that is Irenaeus going against Marcion in his great work against heresies. So there already, Irenaeus has located Marcion within a tradition which he labels as heresy. The word heresy, hieresis, originally simply meaning a an opinion, a sect, a school of thought used within philosophical schools of thought, used even by Josephus when he thinks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Josephus is not worried about seeing himself as being a member of one such group. But by Irenaeus, Irenaeus does not belong to a heresy, a hieresis. That's what other people belong to. The term has gained a purely negative connotation of those who we reject, going back to a tradition that begins to Simon Magus. And for Irenaeus, Marcion is in some ways one of the most threatening and dangerous of heretics or followers of Hieresis, because what he does is he mutilates scripture. He doesn't do what other people like Valentinus do, which is write their own texts, which are self-evidently queer or foolish or strange or peculiar. He mutilates scripture. And notice the words, those of you who've got the Latin, the cutting words, which is the language that Irenaeus uses. Uh, Marcion is a mutilator. He cuts with the scissors. He does not compose with the pen, but with the sword. So what he has got when he's got what he thinks is a gospel is not a gospel, but a part of the gospel. Elsewhere, Irenaeus will accuse Marcion of rejecting the whole gospel, indeed cutting himself off from the gospel by claiming to have a part of the gospel. And with this, Irenaeus may not simply be referring to Marcion's cutting away of the gospel of Luke, but even from Irenaeus' perspective, even to choose one gospel, when we should all know, as Irenaeus knows, that the gospel is a fourfold gospel, with four faces reflecting the four corners of the universe, the four winds, even to claim to one gospel is only to have a share of the gospel, and to only have a share of the gospel is actually to cut yourself off from the gospel, and to cut yourself, therefore, off from the truth of the gospel. For Irenaeus, God will judge those who create schisms for those who cut into the great and glorious body of Christ. They are thereby outside of the church, the church which is protected and is whole without any falsification of the writings. For Irenaeus, wholeness of the scriptural corpus completeness of the locus, the place of salvation, and wholeness of the church are all interrelated with each other. And you corrupt or you cut into one of them and you cut into the whole. You split one of them and you are split from the whole. There's a sense in which church and textualised gospel are almost mirroring each other in their harmony and in the impossibility of any external modification. So, for our next, again, we turn to Tertullian. And for Tertullian, the issue is actually a somewhat different issue. For him, there are two entities, his own gospel, which is my gospel, or our gospel, 
the gospel, which is the church's gospel. And there is Marcion's gospel, which according to Tully and elsewhere, bears no name, can claim no identity. To some extent, the gospel of Luke becomes our gospel, simply because there is, as it were, the negative, the dark side, that mirrors it and establishes its identity. At the same time, Marcion's gospel would have no existence were it not for Tertullian's gospel or the church's gospel. Because Marcion's gospel is a corruption. It is derivative. It bears witness to that which precedes. It is not partial, as it is for Irenaeus, but a perversion. And Tertullian uses the language of corruption, of perversion, of falsification, much more than he uses the language of cutting. And one of the favourite verbs that he uses is that verb adultero, which we saw was used in the Latin translation of the two key verses in 2 Corinthians 2 and 2 Corinthians 4. And there's an interesting discussion to be had there, uh, because of course Marcion was working in Greek, as to quite how we get to this use of this verb uh, adultero. A difficult verb to capture the nuances of in, Mar in Tertullian's writings, although it is one that he uses a lot. To think about it, we might want to ponder on the relationship between our two English words, adultery and adulterate, as when one would adulterate wine, for example. Indeed, Tertullian accuses Marcion, whom he identifies as a shipping manager, of adulterating the goods that he carried for trade. Elsewhere, Tertullian could speak of heresy itself as adulterating the virgin church handed down by Christ. So it carries with it the ideas of an illegitimate attempt to usurp the place, claiming authenticity or even legality where there is none, perhaps inviting moral outrage, a rather different sort of understanding of what is going on. Now, in practice, Tertullian does give some examples what, from what he claims is the text of Marcion's Gospel. And many of the examples he gives suggest that his simple opposition is, after all, not so simple. Quoting from Luke 6.35, implying that Marcion has taken away from him the rain and the sun, an allusion, of course, to a verse which is not found in Luke, but is found in Matthew. And therefore, we have to wonder whether Tertullian, hardly surprisingly, can't remember where his quotation comes from, assuming that Marcion has cut it out from Luke when it isn't from Luke, or whether uh, Tertullian is also thinking of a whole single gospel differently embodied in both Luke and in Matthew. Or Luke 12.14, which Tertullian, in fact, without comment, quotes as who made me a judge over you, implying that Jesus, responding to the two brothers who are arguing over the inheritance, that he is not a judge. Remember, the creator God, who Marcion rejects, is a judge Marcion would like. Therefore, the Christ whom he sent to be a judge but if you burrow away in your footnotes at the bottom of your Nestle alarm, as I hope you do, then you will see that, in fact, there's quite a lot of textual variance around Luke 12, 14. Either who made me a judge or divider, which is what Nestle alarm print as their accepted text, although the variants also are there for judge, arbitrator, arbitrator or divider. Did Marcion drop the divider because he thought Jesus would cause division, 
keep the judge because he didn't like judges, or does he simply reflect a textual value? Or this one, the passage that comes from the story of the wife who's handed down the seven brothers, who will she be married to in the age to come, which, according to Tertullian, Marcion reads, as the children of this age marry and are married, but those whom God of that age has judged worthy of possession, etc., don't marry. According to his opponents, Marcion uh, was against procreation and perhaps against marriage, certainly against sexual intercourse. Italian reads it this way. God has judged worthy of possession of that age. Now, if you look at your Greek text, you will see that the question is, where do you pause to take breath? Where do you hold your clauses together? Does of that age go with God or with possession? That actually what we've got here is the way that the text is being readed, read and divided and therefore being interpreted. It's no, by no means quite so straightforward as what we might think of as corruption. For Tertullian already, he is facing something of a problem. In fact, it was there to some extent in Irenaeus. If one is looking at corruption of the gospel in terms of the wording of the gospel, what is the relationship between the gospel, that which is proclaimed, that which gives salvation, which holds the truth, what is the relationship between the gospel and what you've got? And how do you establish that? And how do you establish authenticity? For Italian, for some extent, the answer is by appealing to scripture and prophecy and fulfilment. But we'll turn on now to Epiphanius. Epiphanius is writing his, uh, his panarion, his uh, medicine chest against all heresies, and Marcion is already number 42 out of 80 heresies. You all know why 80 heresies? Because Solomon had 80 concubines, <laughs> according to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> well, Song of Solomon said, says, says, says 80, and it must be right. Um, uh, so, number 42 of uh, 80, uh, 80 heresies. And Epiphanius starts with a biography of Marcion. In fact, if you look on Wikipedia, this is what you'll be told about Marcion. Take that as a warning for starting from Wikipedia when you write your essays, certainly for Dr. Bond, who will immediately uh, find out the error of your ways. Um, uh, Marcion, who happens to be, in this story, the son of a bishop, corrupted a certain virgin and deceived her out of her hope. Uh, remember Tertullian? And in fact, at the same time, or a little bit earlier than Tertullian, Hegesippus had also said, for this reason they used to call the church a virgin, and he was not yet corrupted by empty stories. In Epiphanius' account, heresy has, as it were, become embodied in Marcion, who now has corrupted a real virgin uh, and deceived her of her hope. Uh, that's how stories develop. Um, what Epiphanius does besides much else is to collect a number of excerpts from Marcion's writings and to lay them alongside what either what he says is the right text or using them to show that Marcion actually undermines his own teaching in what he preserves in his Gospel and Paul's letters or, or simply to make some sort of form of accusation. Epiphanius gives 78 excerpts from the Gospel and 40 excerpts from Paul's letters. If you're quick at your maths, you'll work out the 78 and 40 makes 118. 118 is the sum of 118. And if you know your numerical equivalence, you'll know that 100 represents the word Amen and 18 stands for the name of Jesus. So don't suppose necessarily 
that Epiphanius' 78 plus 40 quotations are that was all he knew. That was all that he wanted to tell us. These quotations for him bear the character of the Gospel of Luke and the character of Paul's epistles, but they are counterfeits. They may deceive the innocent, and it is Epiphanius' job, therefore, to protect the innocent by exposing when Marcion has falsely represented the text and to argue against Marcion's theology from what he has retained. And sometimes some of the passages that Epiphanius quotes do resonate with some of the ones that Tertullian does. But other times they don't. And sometimes we may even suspect that Epiphanius hasn't got the vaguest idea why he bothered to take this quotation when he was doing his research and his note-taking. Something, again, that we all may be familiar with. For example... Luke 12, 8, shall confess before the angels of God, Marcion is so committed to destroying the truth in any small matter that instead of saying before the angels of God, he says before God. Serious stuff, this. Sorry, that shows that somewhere it's, about, it's not reflecting it right. That A ought to be a Hebrew Aleph, which you all know is the signal for the uh, Codex Sinaiticus and it's got lost between my computer and this one. Uh, in fact, before God is simply there within the textual tradition. But anyway. Or, he does not have God clothes the grass, from Luke 12, 28, out of which Epiphanius makes a whole meal of showing that that shows that there's something here about Marcion's rejection of God as creator. Um, even the grass. But notice, even though you do not keep what was written as it stands, spoken by the space saviour, even so their places are preserved by the gospel of the Holy Church. There is a place which keeps the words secure. Or this one, which I quite like, which is in the parable of the uh, householder who returns unexpectedly where, according to Epiphanius, Marcin had in the evening watch instead of in the second or third watch, and then he accuses Marcin of being an oath, foolishly changing the text, because you don't have evening watches, because you only have watches during the night, so you don't need one in the evening, uh, but in the fact, the variant for the evening watch is there in the Western tradition of Luke 12, 38. But you can see the sort of way that Epiphanius is actually working. He's working with an assumption that there is a correct text, which is actually important. Important down to the fact of whether or not you read the second or third watch or the evening watch. And when he finds what he thinks is the counterfeit, which has got something different, he has, as it were, waxed eloquent about what is happening there even though he can't actually get very far in saying why it matters, what difference it actually makes uh, to the truth of what we have. Um, what I want to suggest we see in, in Marcion, in Irenaeus, in Tertullian, and in Epiphanius is actually an anxiety almost from the beginning about the possibility of the corruption of the gospel, of the perversion of the gospel. But what we also trace through Marcion, Irenaeus, Tertullian and Epiphanius is an ever-changing nature of changing understanding of the nature of the gospel. One that becomes increasingly textualised, increasingly tied to specific words and to the form of those words. And as that changes, so too does the understanding of what corruption means and how corruption is to be identified. And on one level, this is just another example of what we see as a wider phenomenon in the development of early Christianity, namely of the changing role of the text, even of the physicality and materiality of the text, and the way that the text 
as text comes to carry a very heavy symbolic load. Now, I'm not this evening going to actually go back to the question that I said I wasn't going to discuss as to the true origins of Marcion's Gospel or of his corpus of the Pauline letters. Uh, the general consensus increasingly in scholarship in recent decades has been that what Marcion was familiar with was probably a form of the text which is not the same as the text as it later came to be handed down and as you now have it or as now lies behind the manuscripts that you have it in Nestle Alant. Although precisely how we work out some of those statistics, I, what it was not in whether there is a sort of common commonality to that which was not in Marcion's Luke, apparently. Uh, and there you've got the, the sort of figures which show the disparity uh, between material that is Luke-only material, if you want, and material which is either so-called Mark and Q. Um, there may be some sort of answer within that, those sorts of figures, but I don't want to explore that because what I do want to explore, rather, is to locate what Marcion and those who opposed him are doing within the context of what is going on in the second century. The phenomenon of editing, of transposing, of adding or subtracting and altering the text has to be set within a second century context initially. And what the manuscript discoveries of early Christian texts have shown us is, of course, that there continued to be the production of gospel-like texts, often drawing on materials found in other or earlier written gospel-like texts, often drawing on continuing oral tradition about the words and deeds of Jesus, and that written versus oral is not an either-or, because editing and re-editing happen in the interstices of reading written texts and writing oral experiences. And the Egerton papyrus is simply an example of the sort of processes that are going on in the second century. That gospel production and its relationship to other texts that we are familiar with is a fluid and complex matter within the second century. And we would not be the first to remark on that. Celsus, the second century philosophical critic of Christianity, complained that some believers, as though from drunkenness, have proceeded to set themselves to altering the gospel from the first writing to a third and a fourth and many more. And contemporary scholars debate as to whether this is a reference to the synoptic gospels and perhaps John, remembering that the plurality of the gospels did become something of a theological problem in the early centuries, similar and yet dissimilar, or whether this is a reference to textual variations uh, that were circulating perhaps from the very beginning. Origen's response there is in some ways quite a surprising response. I do not know of anyone who alters the gospel, except for the followers of Marcion and Valentinus and those of Lucanus. Lucanus, according to the tradition, uh, a later disciple of Marcion. Uh, those who alter the gospels and introduce heresies are no accusation against true Christianity. Now, why that in some ways it's a rather surprising, blustering response. It's because Origen, in the same work, had already explained to Celsus that Levi was not an apostle, except according to some copies of the Gospel of Mark, which he seems to be treating as a fairly neutral fact. That's how it is. He does know some other than Marcion and Valentinus and Lucanus. Uh, anybody who's had to study uh, textual criticism hopefully will have a study fairly early on in their work Origen who introduced into biblical analysis the sorts of signs and symbols, the marks that had been developed for comparing manuscripts of the great classical authors so for example similarly 
when commenting on the fact that in Matthew's version of the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler not only talks about the, the five of the commandments of the Decalogue that he has observed from his youth, but also lists there, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, which is not in the Markan or Lucan versions of that story. Her origin then explains why it is there uh, within the tradition. Acknowledging that there is risen much disagreement between copies, some simply from laziness of scribes, some from villainous temerity of others, some from the disregard of the correction of what was written. I presupposing that there are corrections to the text which are supposed to note and incorporate as you follow and make your own, adding or taking away what seems right to them. A problem and a difficulty and a source often of confusion, particularly of the innocent, but not here, simply the work of those who introduce heresy into the life of the church. And of course we could uh, adduce other examples where we know of such textual variation as simply being part of what it was. Um, one example indeed would be P69, which not only omits verses 43 to 44 of Luke 22, Jesus is sweating of blood and the angel who comes to him, but actually omits a rather larger chunk, verses 42 through to 45. Some have suggested that perhaps this is a Marcionite text. Um, but I think that unlikely, but cannot prove it either way. Uh, more probably simply a reflection precisely of what Origen was talking about, the tendency within the manuscript tradition for addition or alteration or omission, whether by scribe or accident or by villainous temerity or by not doing the corrections you should be doing or for doctrinal reasons. And of course such conflicts over the interpretation of authoritative texts and over their textual form were not limited to Marcion, to Irenaeus, to Tertullian, Origen and their circles because they were a central feature of contemporary intellectual life. And underlying this was the principle that was true of all groups, Christian and non-Christian groups in this period. That, to quote David Sedley, the role of scriptural authority was to provide a philosophical movement with a raison d'etre and a framework within which it could preserve its obsession while continuing to inquire and debate. And because scripture was always in dialogue with current debates and current interpretation, then inevitably that led to the tendency to fight over texts, to read and to reread texts. Indeed, it's been argued that one of the main activities of philosophical teachers in the second century was the analysis and the interpretation of texts. Because the assumption was that the authoritative figures of the past, for non-Christians preeminently Plato and Homer, did indeed testify to the truth. But the exposition of the truth required interpretative skill, and demonstration by their contemporary disciples. It demanded a variety of approaches. Obscurities or ambiguities of the argument needed to be explained. Conflicting interpretations within the tradition required resolution. Variations between manuscripts and the possibilities of spurious works were known problems and that provoked critical analysis. In some cases, as in the case of Homer, obscure and even embarrassing references, such as the anthropomorphic representation of the gods, demanded some sort of explanation that would make them less obscure and less embarrassing. And some of these issues were explored through commentaries of different kinds, and in other cases, they were explored through oral discussions of the teacher. And some of those oral discussions by the teacher may in time have been written down. 
perhaps by disciples, and others were not, because that was simply part of the intellectual life of the time, an intellectual life in which many of the early Christians, at least from a particular educational background, participated. And there, again, another commentary, this time on the Odyssey. Quite often, these words from Porphyry, as quoted by Eusebius, have been quoted, Porphyry, a generation or more after Origen, talking about his collection of philosophy from the oracles, his collection of oracular sources that he thought could be the source of divine truth. I call the gods to witness that I did not add anything or take anything away. Remember, that was the language which Irenaeus had used when he talked about uh, not adding or taking away anything to the church or to the scriptures of the church which have preserved. This is formulaic language. I did not add anything or take anything away from the intentions that were used, except where I have corrected an erroneous phrase, or made a change for greater clarity, or completed the metre if it was incomplete or struck out anything which did not serve the purpose, so that I preserved untouched <laughs> the intention of the words. I think what, to ta- what Porphyry says there could probably have been said by any of the witnesses that, that we have been interrogating this evening. Tertullian's answer, with which we started, was no doubt rhetorically highly effective but it was far too simplistic a solution. The question has been asked, and I think the question has to be asked, whenever the gospel is preached, whenever a text is translated, or paraphrased, or sung, or turned into drama, or even turned into a so-called critical text, when is the gospel not the gospel? Here. Thank you very much for a very stimulating uh, lecture, which I'm sure will provoke some questions and uh, comments from uh, uh, the audience tonight. So the floor is open, and uh, Professor Lou invites your, your responses. I think there is one thing we know for, for certain, almost for certain, about Marcia. Um, and that is when he arrived, the date at which he arrived in Rome, which I think you alluded to. Um, this is discussed in Sebastian Moll's mm. book. Now, uh, Sebastian makes a hash of interpreting Tertullian. He gets the right answer. <laughs> that Marcion is. Not like Porphyry. Well, actually, the, the passage of Porphyry is very interesting because the closest parallel is, in fact, in the instructions to the compilers of the Theodosian Code. Mm-hmm. You're only to clarify and so on and so mm. forth, but mm. not to change the, the meaning. Mm. They didn't succeed. <laughs> and that, that's demonstrable in yeah. that case. But to go back to, the, the, it's, it's one of these uh, Tertullian sort of outdoing himself. Uh, but uh, what it comes down to is uh, that a Marcion must have said that he arrived in Rome in is it the 15th, whatever the year is. It's, it, yeah. yeah. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's how he relates it to how many years there are since. Jesus appeared under Tiberius that's right, in the 50th right. of Tiberius. And, yeah. and the number of 115 and a half mm, yeah. <laughs> is not something you just no. get out of. So, uh, and this is actually I think, very important because of the passage you quoted from uh, Justin. You could put the construction you could put on that is that Marcion's written work all came, say, after 160. Mm. I think there's been a tendency in scholarship to put Marcion far too early. Mm. No, I, I'd agree with, with where you ended, that, that, that people have tended to, and, and partly this has been ch- chicken and egg, because they say, oh, Marcion taught, you know, d- d- downgraded the creator. When everybody, whenever any author, like most early Christian authors, celebrate God as creator, they must be anti-Marcionite, and there's been a sort of slight circularity there. Uh, I agree that, yes, Tertullian fixes the year 144, although uh, the Chronicle of Edessa goes back to 135. Uh, seems to date it to 135. Uh, It's not clear from Tertullian whether 144 is 
when Marcion arrives in Rome, or when Marcion breaks with the Roman church, if indeed his break with the church is long after his arrival in Rome. And one of the problems with interpreting it is actually knowing the sequence of events around there. So we do end up with 144, but quite what 144 is yeah, is a bit less clear. In view of the number of scholars who, who try to put Mars in a generation earlier. Yeah, no, I don't think that works. Mm. Can, can you say something about the, the actual the, the text that's behind it? Because you had, some, you had a diagram of pretty quite detailed statistics about this. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm getting the impression that basically this is constructed from that Epiphanius. Uh, but we, we presumably don't have uh, a, a text that could be ascribed to Mayon and Luke. And likewise, of uh, the, 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 the epistles of Paul. I mean, is, is it just sort of hearsay? I mean, did he select particular epistles and not others? Or did he, was it felt that he had texts of Paul that were corrupt in some way? Or. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, that, it's a very difficult question to answer because we're always looking through uh, the lens of what we are told. And as I suggested with Epiphanius, uh, Epiphanius t- gives us the passages he gives us, or at least he gives us the number he gives us, because it suits his purposes, not because that's a sum total of what he knows. So we've, all, we've always got that. There have been lots of attempts to reconstruct uh, Marcion's text, which one... And our main sources are Tertullian and Epiphanius. And Tertullian, of course, we've got the problem of working through the Latin and not knowing at what stage the, the Latin translation is working at, whether it's by Tertullian or whether he's working with a Latin version of Marcion. Uh, and we do find odd other references to things that Marcion has and hasn't got, but not so systematically as in Tertullian and Epiphanius. Um, and there have been various attempts to reconstruct Marcion's gospel and apostolic on the basis of that. In terms of the identity of the Pauline epistles, uh, most of his opponents agree that he hasn't got the pastoral epistles, although whether that is because he did not know them is, of course, tied up with the question of the date of the pastorals. And the whole issue is tied up with the debate of the formation of the Pauline corpus, for which Marcion is one of the key bits of evidence. So, uh, again, with the, the circularity. Um, so, something like, especially when you get down to 0.5 of verses, uh, it always reminds me a bit of, I don't know whether it's still the case, uh, when I started my, my theological training and did JEDP, you know, and, and you could sort of colour code JEDP. Yes, the sources of the Pentateuch, down to sort of half verses and things with great precision. Um, uh, I, I suspect there is more in the uncertain than there, than there, there should be the uncertain. But there have been various attempts to. Um, this, I didn't put in the uh, slides that I showed you, but I quite like this one. Um, uh, you can buy this for 15 Australian dollars. Um, the first Bible, this is an attempt to. Uh, published Marcin's text. There have been more scholarly ones. I know there's one about to come out. Uh, there have been more scholarly ones. I rather like first time in paperback for 1700 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, but but, it is, but there, there have been various attempts. And, and um, in Harnack, Adolf von Harnack's great book on Marcin, uh, the second half of that has got a reconstruction of the text of, of Marcin's Gospel and Letters. Um, uh, Theodore Zahn uh, as part of his history of the canon has done s- something similar and there have been other attempts recently uh, and you know, it, it's always a question of how seriously you take Tertullian or Epiphanius when they don't support each other as to the statement that something is missing or how seriously you take the fact that they simply don't attest to certain chapters, whether that means that they were missing or they simply don't bother to tell you. Uh, so it, it is always a very complex exercise. Thank you very much for that very illuminating talk. Uh, just a, if I can bring you back to the, uh, the, the last slide that you ended us with, the, the porphyry, mm. and the, the question that um, there seems to be a paradox uh, to quoting the, what, the canonical formula, is it? The don't add, don't mm. subtract. Uh, 
but yet then going on to clarify, take away, doing exactly mm. and saying at the end that actually I'm preserving untouched <laughs> yeah. the intention. It, can I ask what what is I, I I I don't know this passage. Is it what's behind it? Is it is it is it actually the text, the same text in Greek? Or is it translation or what? Because I find the same phenomenon in Josephus right. when, he, when he retells the story of the, yeah. of the origins of the, uh, of the scepter. Right. And I mean, you're right. The, I, I said did not add or anything or take anything that recalls what Irenaeus said, but of course it goes back to Deuteronomy. Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, in the, the Deuteronomy verse is echoed by the letter of Aristotle, yes. isn't it? Yep. So, so, th- so there's a whole tradition there um, of, I mean, even, even with the letter of Aristotle and all the Septuagint, of translating, uh, which inevitably involves change, and saying this is not, that this doesn't fall under the accusation of adding. Or taking away. Yeah, that's um, right, because uh, in some ways with Josephus, it's, a, it's well, the way I've argued it, as you know, is that the, the, uh, it's the Hebrew text for him is the, is the key. It's hmm. the emergence of, of, of the Hebrew text as being the scripture, hmm. uh, which is then followed up in the Christian pardon me, um, that says that scripture has to be written on skin. Hmm. In Assyrian script and in ink, you know, I yeah. think there's a there's a polemic that the, mm. that's happening. Uh, I think that with, with the with the rise of the Christian gospel, maybe. But I, I don't know what this this context. No, is. and this is um, this is Eusebius in his preparation of the gospel uh, before he's talking about Porphyry, quoting bits of Porphyry's um, where where Porphyry collects together okay. uh, oracles that that. He argues, you know, can be interpreted to, to so contain they, divine truth, and I don't know whether uh, Tim yeah. Barnes would want so to say. Some of them are, are um, the accuracy of Porphyry is confirmed by inscriptions, right? And he is claiming this is straight quotation, hmm. except for the, you know, the possibility of it being somehow yeah. mistaken. But um, it's there's nothing symbolic about it. It's you see, it's only quotes accurately because. I mean, he clearly had a copy of the Philosopher's Oracles. And, and in the Preparatio, you occasionally have the instruction to his disciples, take it off the shelf and read it. Mm. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think this actually helps your argument particularly, given uh, all the, those other uncertainties. Yeah. Here it's a, a, someone writing in Greek, quoting um, oracles which were on the whole inscribed on stone, hmm. and simply saying, I'm giving the text as, as it's found. Yeah, although when he's talking about writing down Plotinus's teaching, he refers to the fact that Plotinus yeah. was careless and didn't worry about spellings and things like that. Am I well, on dangerous uh, ground here? No, no, well, the, the life of Plotinus is one of the most misleading documents. Right, I won't go there then. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just finish, I mean, uh, allowing for that... Uh, I suppose, and I don't know whether that would cover this one as well, I suppose where I try and locate it is, is almost where I try to finish with, with the problem that I think each of our authors are dealing with, is, I mean, to some extent, you could say it's the question of, of intention. How do you preserve the truth of the text? If you are suspicious at times that the versions of the truth that you are copying out have been corrupted in some some way. And sometimes you may be suspicious they've been corrupted because you do not think the revered authority could possibly have said or meant what the text appears to say or mean. It also seems you know what the truth is. Yeah, yes. (laughs) Well, it's what I know it to be. Um, he's only the first one to say this is in or this is out if he knew more than he used. 
Um, and I think I would want to argue that the gospel that he used and edited was the gospel he knew, which is probably what we would more or less expect at the time at which he's working. I, I don't think he rejected Mark, Matthew and John. I, I, he did not exclude them. That's what he's accused of doing as soon as everybody takes for granted that that is what they ought to be. Um, and the same, I think, with the Pauline letters. He's, although much later in the tradition he's accused, well, later in the tradition he's accused of rejecting acts, I don't think he knew acts. Um, I don't really think he knew the pastoral epistles. Uh, so I don't think he is, he may be engaged in some sort of editorial textual work, but on the basis of a distinctive text form. But then what I've tried to say is other people are doing that as well. Um, does he invent the idea of, well, it depends what you think the idea of what. Does he invent the idea of, well, Timothy might want to say something. Does he invent the idea of canon, whatever we mean by canon? Does he invent the idea of closed text? I don't think we've got the answer to that one. I think he does bring together a gospel and a corpus of Pauline letters. I think he's probably not the person who makes that corpus of Pauline letters. I think it's probably already in existence, although it's quite difficult to demonstrate that. Um, and I think he does read the references in Galatians to a gospel in the light of the text that he has got. Uh, but quite how he then relates those together and... Uh, what sort of authority they have, um, I think it's much more difficult to answer. Uh, and there is a danger in, in thinking anachronistically. You know, saying, oh, we well, you know what a canon was, who was the first to do it? And was it Marcion? And I, I do think we have to sort of locate him within his time and see what's going on in the way texts are, are coming together, are being quoted, are being used, which is a very elongated process, not a, you know, Today we haven't got a canon and tomorrow we have got one, sort of thing. Could I just ask you a general point? Um, <coughs> if we put Marcin in Rome, the later we put it, um, it would seem to me that it makes, pardon me for saying so, a bit more problematic what you were just saying. Um, I mean, if Justin is already aware of multiple gospels being read regularly in churches, and uh, this, this would suggest, and he's in Rome, this would suggest to me that a certain number of learned Christians in Rome are well aware that there are multiple Gospels mm. suitable for ecclesiastical reading. Mm. So how could Marcion be ignorant of that and have only access to Luke? And the other larger question is that, that, that I would want to ask is, uh, is we do accept, right, it's clear that he did not treat uh, what Christians call the Old Testament as Scripture. So that would be a fairly significant departure or excision of what had been regarded as scripture. Um, if I can start with the last one. Uh, saying that he did not treat the Old Testament as scripture, I think it was very important for Marcion because it gave you the CV for the Creator God. Uh, but it just wasn't a very impressive CV. Be because it is, and in that sense, it doesn't function as whatever you think, however you think scripture ought to function. Um, now, Marcion is not the only person who is reading what becomes known as the Old Testament and which then becomes um, increasingly regularly used within the prophecy and fulfillment schema. He's not the only one who's reading that in different ways. Yeah, so is Valentine, and so all sorts of other people who are also operating in Rome. Um, and you could say that Marcion takes it more seriously than to people like Valentinus, because he takes it seriously as a record of the Creator God. Or certainly those bits that we know he read, although the bits that are referred to are, are mainly from uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, but also the stories of Elisha and Elijah. Um, so possibly prophetic passages. So... Um, so in that sense, he doesn't reject it as scripture, but he defines it in relationship to his understanding of 
God. Which is why we have this problem that I started with as to whether we start with his understanding of God. The high God versus the demiurge, which makes sense in a second century context. Or we start with his reading of texts. So that, that I think, is the problem when we try and articulate what's happening in his use of what Christians will later call the Old Testament. I think the question of what texts he knows and what text Justin knows um, ties up with the question of the dating, of, of at what stage he comes to Rome, um, what he brings with him, and how soon he sets up teaching with his version of what he's brought with him, uh, in that sense. Um, and you know, I, I suppose my, my argument would prob probably be, I mean, Tertullian implies that there was extant a letter of, of Marcion that implied that he did break with the Roman church, and later Epiphanius turns that into a wonderful narrative. Um, uh, but quite what the sequence of events are, I think, is actually quite difficult to work out. And I would want to locate Marcion, as I think I would want to locate... Uh, Valentinus and, and probably others within the context of inverted commas schools rather like Justin is portrayed within the martyrdom of Justin or of teachers with their groups of hearers and listeners interpreting what for them are their key texts um, so I would, I would certainly I think in that context want to argue that when Marcion starts developing his teaching and his understanding what he's got is, 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 is Paul and Luke. And why should he suddenly then say, oh, that chap over there, Justin, has got you know, a couple of others, if he had? And, and I actually think there is a problem of knowing exactly what Justin is working with because of the textual form of the, of, of the versions of Jesus' sayings in Justin. Mm. Well, some of the examples that I gave like that one, for example where Epiphanius assumes that what Marcion has done is got rid of the wording second or third watch and adds put in in the evening watch in fact, when we look at the textual tradition the language of evening watch is actually there in part of the textual tradition in, in this case, in Codex Biza. Um, and the same, for example, where he's accused of changing uh, the angel's God to before God, when again the variant there is a variant within the text of tradition. Now, either you argue that all the variants which are levelled against Marcion as his deliberate changes then entered into the textual tradition, which I think is unlikely. Or you can argue that Marcion, some of the places, not necessarily all of them, but a number of the places where Marcion is accused of changing the text, he's actually working with a different textual tradition. Now, this has been worked through in terms of Marcion's text of Paul uh, by Ulrich Schmidt. Uh, where he worked through the evidence for Marcin's text on Paul, mainly from Tertullian and Epiphanius, but also some of the references in Ephraim and other places, and actually saw a family likeness, in which case this would be an exception, a family likeness to so-called accusations against Marcin, to Marcin-like type <coughs> variations, that they seem to cluster around what we would call the Western tradition, uh, particularly a, a particular sort of channel, as it were, trajectory within the Western tradition. So however we would understand the origin of textual variants, or even parallel versions of the same texts in different geographical locations, then Marcion is working with a distinctive form of the text already. Okay. Do you, do you envision that... Uh, so this is the Western text that you envision? Yep, yeah. Would you say that 
Well, I mean, that's, that's where it sometimes gets complicated because there are points, um, not one that I've actually got on an overhead, uh, there are points at which, because INS doesn't actually give a whole lot of lists of, um, of, of Martinite variations, as it were. And there are one, one or two points, yes, where uh, passages that Marcion is accused of changing are, in fact, attested in INS. There's, there's the one about, um, I can't even remember what the text is about, and the son doesn't know the father, or the father doesn't know the son, or whichever order uh, one puts it in. Um, no one knows who the son is except the father, or who the father is except the son, or whatever sequence that goes in, uh, which actually has got a huge sort of body of textual variants. Um, and that which is later associated with Marcion is actually already read by Irenaeus, uh, although it doesn't become... Uh, the Alexandrian text, which in fact is the text that Nestle Alland used. And there's the same combination at times with um, Tertullian. Uh, because this one, who made me a judge over you, Tertullian doesn't actually comment on, at this point, the fact that it ought to, inverted commas, read who made me a judge or divider over you. So either one can argue, well, Italian doesn't recognise this as an alteration of the text, i.e. it is the text which he knows who made me a judge over you, and it is there within the textual tradition. Uh, although one could also argue that if Marcion knew the text, who made me a judge or divider, it would suit him very well only to read judge, I, to have Jesus deny that he's a judge because judging is associated with the creator God. So there are points actually at deciding how, Mar how Tertullian's text and Marcion's text relate together. Uh, it's almost impossible to tell because Tertullian doesn't comment on what to our Nestle Alarm trained eyes looks like a variant or corruption. Does that, can you, so, it, I mean, that complicates the question I was asked earlier about reconstructing the text. Really. there was a lot of variation in demiurgical understandings in the time. Uh, so, no doubt he did teach something demiurgical, but he wasn't the only person teaching it. Um, now, you've also got within the Platonism of the period, building on what Plato himself says in the Timaeus, debates about the relationship, about the function and role of the demiurgos. Uh, and exactly how that relate, how you know where where the demiurgos fit. So, you know, there's a broader philosophical context for trying to make sense of the relationship between being and becoming. That which doesn't change and that which is involved in change, which is what the demiurge is all, to some extent, uh, caught up with. So you've got people like Valentinus, and you've got people like Heraclian, and you've got people like the so-called Gnostics, also dealing with that question of the relationship between the demiurge and, and, and the unknown god. Uh, and, and Marcion fits into that wider conspectus. So he's certainly not the only person who's, who's doing it. Um, what 
seems to be characteristic of the way that Marcion does it is that when we look at um, many of the so-called Gnostics, at least as we find them reported by, say, Irenaeus, but also as we find them in the Nag Hammadi texts, there tends to be, I mean, they're interested in cosmogony, the origins of, of cosmos. Uh, and often they understand the appearance of the demiurge in terms of a fall within the divine. So the demiurge, you know, and you often get wisdom and acmeoth and other things involved in that. Uh, the demiurge involved, get, emerges in a process of decline or fall or something within the totality of the divine. You could say Gnostic systems in that sense, not really dualistic, they're monist. Uh, none of Marcion's detractors, until we get as late as Esnick of Kolb, until we get to 5th century over to the east, actually ascribe to Marcion any cosmogonic interests, i.e. any interest in the origins of um, the divine world. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that he actually related the demiurge to the unknown god in the way that Valentinus does. Uh, that's simply not part of his interest. Um, now, whether that says something about the balance in his thought between philosophical interests and biblical interests, um, it's, that's quite difficult to untie. I think there is something there, but it's quite difficult. So, again, he fits in the complex um, threads that were going on within the second century. Now, undoubtedly, many of his opponents see him as more threatening than some of his contemporaries. Um, and... And according to Irenaeus, that's because he's actually, he doesn't go to outside texts. He doesn't write his own gospels or, or claim alternative revelations uh, like some of them do. Uh, and there is a whole debate, uh, particularly in discussions of the origin of Christian anti-Judaism, as to how far Christian anti-Judaism is triggered by polemic against Marcion. Because in order to retain the creator God and the creator God's doings and words, they have to explain <coughs> it in ways that Marcion does not explain it, if you see what I mean. And, and, and therefore, uh, that the scriptures ought to be read allegorically, spiritually, that the Jews are, are, are literalistic and uh, wooden in reading it literally, then uh, is, a, is a sort of reflex. Now, I think it's too simplistic just to explain it like that. But yeah, there are, I think Marcion is still quite a focal figure. Uh, within what happens in the second to third century. Very briefly here, and then we'll keep that. Is there any thinking that uh, Marcin warmed a lot to Paul's way of teaching in the sense that the Hellenistic diatribe was the means by which Paul projected a lot of his teachings to uh, the um, Gentiles of the time? And um, is there any historical context in the Marcin was from a wealthy family, shipowning, with a bit of influence, that he would have warmed to the Pauline way of teaching and this was his method of conveying information of which the church found threatening at the time. Um, yes, of course whether or how, how wealthy Marcin was or his family depends both how you translate the word which describes what his relationship to ships was, uh, and also the tradition that Tertullian reports that um, the money he gave the church was thrown back at him when he left it, but that's part of a fairly common polemic. Um, no, I think Marcion reads Paul rather like I suggested as a narrative, and whether or not Marcion did, like a 21st century undergraduate has to do, make comparisons with Hellenistic diatribe, um, I don't think that's how he would have read I think when I say that Marcion is operating in a school context in, in, in the second century, that's because that's what Justin is doing, that's what Valentinus is doing, uh, and that's what perhaps uh, other people are doing as well, that it's, it's part of, of what's going on socially within Rome uh, in the context, I think.